This morning I'm entitled this sermon considering the Christian the Christian's calling considering the Christian's calling to the Corinthians the Apostle Paul spoke of the gospel and he called it the word of the cross 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18 then in encouraging the brethren to remain faithful Paul admonished them to consider your calling, 1 Corinthians 1, 26. Thus, the title of this sermon, Considering the Christian's Calling. So to remain faithful to the Lord, we must do the same if we truly desire to please the Lord and to enter into heaven. So the question automatically arises, what is the Christian's calling? And Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica, and he helps us on that. And he says that Christians are called through the gospel, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14. You remember that Mark's account of the Great Commission, Mark 16, 15, declared that the gospel would be preached to every creature. And then Paul says, as we probably refer to this many times, that the gospel is God's power to save us. But now it's interesting, when the gospel is that important, that to the world, the gospel is, according to Paul, foolishness. But to the Christians, the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. Now, the difference has to do with one's reaction to the gospel. In being called, remember, through the gospel, the avenue of calling is the gospel, 2 Thessalonians 2.14, that means we're called to conform, conform to the gospel. And as Paul rehearsed in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, the foundation of the gospel is the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in becoming a Christian, then we must conform to the gospel plan of salvation by becoming dead to sin, having believed in him, become dead to sin, which means we repent of sin being buried with, him in by, uh, buried with him by baptism into his death, and being raised to walk in newness of life, Romans 6, 3 through 6. This is our calling. Our calling is to believe in Christ and to obey him and to walk in such a way as to please him at all times and at all places. Some are going to answer this call, but sadly, the Bible says many will not do so. Notice what Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 29. Notice, for ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world. And things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. That within itself lets us know that if men left to their own devices without the revelation of God, they will come up with things completely foreign to the way that God challenges us, to the way that He causes us to have faith, confidence, trust, belief in Him and all things pertaining to Him. 
So in this sermon, I want us to consider the difference between those who reject the call of the Lord or the call of the gospel and those who will answer and have answered that call. First of all, those who are rejecting the call, who have rejected it. Those who are, as Paul refers to them, wise according to the flesh. Well, what does that mean? Well, this morning in our class in the back building, we refer to ourselves to 1 John, where he defines the matter of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of reign, glory of life. It says these things are not of the Father. They're of the world. People of the world then will rest on those things. And they will value whatever the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life leads them to value. But Paul said that we cannot come to know God through the world's wisdom, 1 Corinthians 1.21. Rather, we come to know God only through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we must understand that was given for everybody to know. Preach the gospel to every creature, Mark 16, 15. However, those who reject the call of the gospel value learning or wisdom of this world and thus they are puffed up. They are filled with pride. If you look at the wisdom of this world, it will cause one to be exclusive. It will cause one to place himself or herself upon a pedestal designed to say, I am better than you are. Paul warned that knowledge makes one, I believe using the New King James Version, arrogant. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. These people want worldly wisdom that others do not have, and they cannot obtain. Arrogance is the attitude, the state of mind, the mindset behind all of this. But does the Bible deal with that frame of mind? It certainly does. The inspired James condemned this attitude when he wrote, uh, God is opposed to the proud. He gives grace to the humble, James 4 and verse 6. When one understands the gospel, when one understands just what all it meant to Christ to make salvation possible, one will understand rather quickly humility and what it is to be humble. God is said to oppose the proud because they, in their arrogance, their exclusiveness, will oppose him. Those reject the gospel who are mighty according to the fleshly perspective of who's mighty and who's powerful. The word translated mighty means just that, powerful or strong. It's the idea that one, due to his own strength and prowess, so we might say even his own IQ, is in need of nothing. We have a church like that in the scriptures found in Revelation 3.11, the church in Laodicea. And here's how that church was addressed by the Lord through the Holy Spirit. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. You don't know that you're wretched miserable and poor and blind and naked. Revelation 3.17 The world's perspective is totally different from the person who's anchored in the Word of God and who sees all things in the light of the will of heaven as to the design and purpose of life in the flesh on earth and how it's to be lived from the person who's void of anything but himself. And we'll talk about sometimes people being filled up with himself. Well, that's a good way to describe this. But a person who is of the gospel, is filled up with the gospel, is forming the disposition of mind that the New Testament teaches. Paul warned against the mentality we're speaking of here, that is, 
the arrogant one, when he wrote to the saints at Rome saying this, I, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. Romans 12 and verse 3. You remember the Judaizing teacher, he placed his confidence and his trust in the fleshly genealogy. Paul even said, I'll compare myself the way they would compare who's great. And he said, I do this only because you don't get it when I speak on a spiritual level. And he says, they don't even compare to me if we get out on the fleshly level. But he says, I'm not going to measure how I'm acceptable to God or not on the basis of that. I'm going to measure how much I know the truth and live in harmony with it. And so it should be with us. As one thinks too highly of himself, what ends up in his life, if he carries it to its logical and ultimate conclusion, is that he doesn't need God. If you will look at every one of these atheists, who says, I know God does not exist, then they have decided they're so great they don't need God. It's all happened in their intellect, in their thinking. And this will lead those with this attitude to reject the gospel. And thus, as Paul said, the gospel is foolishness unto them that are lost. What about those who are noble, Noble, according to the flesh. Well, this usually has something to do with um, their status, and their birth, and that they're special, and they don't have to submit to the same things you peons do. As we read through the scriptures, we see one thing about the Jews, and one reason they wouldn't accept Christ, is because they took pride in their heritage. John the Baptist said of them as he was working to prepare them to receive Christ, don't say among yourselves that we have Abraham our father. You realize he's saying, if you're a descendant of Abraham, you got it made. That's all it takes. Just get your genealogy right all the way back to Abraham, and you've got a first-class ticket to glory. Well, John sort of reduced that because he said, for I say unto you that God can raise up children of Abraham from these stones. If you think about that for a minute, that's interesting. God could take the genetic structure of that stone and turn it into the genetic structure of Abraham. That's interesting, which also comments a lot on the power of God, Matthew 3 and verse 9. In other words, God could choose anyone to be among his people. But this pride and heritage wasn't just limited to the Jews. It's been characteristic, if you read anything in history, of people throughout history. People have taken pride in their family, their race, their nation, their economic status. And you can just go on and on what they take pride in. And when you have a disposition of mind like that, <coughs> then that handicaps you from receiving the gospel as you need to. This continues today. There's no use trying to think we are to go out into the world and try to convert people by teaching them the gospel and not meet with this kind of thing. Let's just face it, there are folks who think they're better than other folks. Paul made it clear that any reason we may have to boast in the flesh is worthless, it's vain, it's pointless. After listing all the things about which people could boast, here's what he wrote. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 7. We read it this morning again in the class. But whatsoever things are gained to me, those I counted loss to obtain the excellency of Christ or for the sake of Christ. If anything like that in my life was going to handicap me from understanding what it is to be my, my Lord, then it just has to go. No one's heritage or status in society is so, is so important. Let me emphasize it again. It's so important that he does not need the Lord. 
What about those who answer the call, who hear the gospel, who understand it, who embrace it, who submit to it? Are those who accept the wisdom from above? That's what it comes down to. The gospel is the wisdom from above or from God. This wisdom has been with God according to Proverbs 8 and verse 22 from the beginning. And we can obtain this wisdom only by following the word of truth. Now the wise man said in Proverbs 23 and verse 23, Buy the truth and sell it not. Get wisdom and instruction and understanding. Proverbs 22, 23. What's amazing to me is the people with great IQs who can obtain fantastic education and various degrees and indicates they have reached a certain regimen of study and they can't understand the gospel. Why is that the case? Because of what we've been saying up to this point. And Paul even talked about some who were ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That is, to come to the knowledge of God's wisdom, of His gospel. And thus it's foolishness to them. So just because a person has a high IQ doesn't mean he's got any sense. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. And by that, you see, I've defined it in this lesson here. When people of such caliber call the gospel foolishness. Some of them may have very high IQs. But they're interested in what things are according to the measure of this world. I learned from Psalm 119 verse 160 that God's word is truth. I see the same in the New Testament. Jesus prayed, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17 verse 17. The conclusion is that we must follow His Word in order to obtain wisdom. There's really no true wise man who does not follow the truth of God's Word. Ephesians 5.15, Paul said, We must walk not as unwise men, but as wise. Now you know how he uses the word wise and unwise. Wise man is receptive to the truth of the Gospel. We'll live by the Gospel. An unwise man, he may have 50 PhDs in every kind of hard science there is. But because he measures everything on the basis of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, of pride of life, it's not going to make any difference with him coming to the knowledge of the truth of the gospel. It'll be foolishness unto him. So we accomplish getting this wisdom by being doers of the Word and not hearers only. So you see, it's more than just understanding the meaning of the words of the Bible. God's ordained a situation to where you put it into practice and all of it together is what gives you wisdom, James 1.22. So even that is beyond just getting it into your mind. Wisdom comes when you get it into your mind and then you put it into practice. Who are those that are strong in the Lord? Well, I think uh, we would say that they have considered their calling. Consider they're strong in the Lord. Why? Well, this is what Paul confidently stated. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Philippians 4.13. People want to talk about power of positive thinking. You ought to do that one. And you can't. I can do all things. I am able to do all things through Him. There's the avenue. Through Him who strengthens me. Well, you've got to be persuaded by the truth of the gospel. You've got to live and put it into practice. He told the Ephesians, be strong in the Lord. Ephesians 6.10. And I, how could they do this? Well, he tells them in Ephesians 6 and, well, beginning in verse 11 all the way through verse 16, and he talks about putting on the whole armor of God. We won't try to go through all that now. That's a sermon or more than one sermon in itself. But nevertheless, that's what he's doing. You want to be strong? You want to be wise? Here is the way it's done. 
You learn it, but then you practice it. And we will find that the people to whom the Hebrews epistle was written were not doing that. He said, for, when for the time, you've had time, you should be doing this. When for the time, you ought to be teachers. You have need again that one teach you in the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have need of milk and not strong drink or strong meat. I don't think you want strong drink. Strong meat. Because you haven't exercised your senses. Well, how do you do that? And it all has to do with I know what the Bible says. And I know what it means when I apply it to whatever I'm doing during the day as to the choices that I make. We're up against a powerful enemy and we need all we can get to overcome him. If there's anything that a Christian ought to learn, first, foremost, and always, is how powerful and how determined our adversary, the devil, is. For we struggle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against workers, the forces of the world, of this darkness, against spiritual wickedness in high or heavenly places. Ephesians 6 and 12. You need all you can get to face the devil. Your adversary that, like a roaring lion, goeth about seeking whom he may devour. Despite this, the Apostle Paul wrote, We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Romans 8, 37. But notice it's through him. Notice all this in him and through him and by him. Well, that comes from employing the truth of the gospel. No wonder most of the letters of the New Testament are written to Christians. We need all that to help us stay in the straight and narrow way. Those who have been born again as children of God are those who are heeding the calling, the gospel. I don't guess any of us really appreciate like we ought to what a privilege it is to be a child of God. John wrote it this way. See how great a love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. 1 John 3 and verse 1. John said in his gospel that those who believe in his name have the right to become children of God, John 1.12. Now this destroys the idea that all you have to do to be beneficiaries of the gospel, that is, have salvation from sins, is to believe only. All he says here is that the believer has now put himself in a position as a believer in Christ and the Son of God to become a child of God. Certainly, if you don't believe in Christ, you're not going to obey Him as the Son of God. So you must be brought to belief in Him first. But belief only won't save you. James makes that clear in James 2. Faith apart from works is dead, being alone. Now, the sad part about it is simply to bring somebody to believe in Christ as the Son of God is as far as some people get. They all will not obey the gospel. If you look in John 12, 42 through 43, that's made very clear. There were those in Jesus' ministry who believed him when it came to him being the Messiah, the anointed one. They wouldn't obey him. They wouldn't take him at his word. But we have the opportunity to be born again, as it were, and that's through immersion in water, baptism into Christ. We have that taught plainly in John 3, verses 3 through 5, that we must be born again. It is imperative. You cannot go to heaven and not be born again. But what is that new birth? A birth of water in the Spirit. Thus, there's water in the plan. The water won't clean you at all. But it is the place where you show your trust in God in going through a form of His death, His burial, and resurrection. Romans 6, 3 and 4. And 17 and 18. Baptism 
does also now save us. It won't save the unbeliever. It will not save the one who is not repented. But for the one who from the heart believes in Christ and repents of sins, will confess one's faith in Christ before men, it will save that person from his past sins. It won't live the Christian life for him. It won't worship God as he says. It won't study the Bible for him. It won't pray for him. It won't visit the sick and the orphans and all of that. But it will remit past sins. And you will be baptized into Christ. Romans 6, 3 and 4. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Your sins are remitted. They don't stand against you anymore. These are alien sins. From the first one you ever committed that separated you from God, to however many you committed before you repented, having believed in Christ, and were baptized into Him for the remission of your sins. So this, in Christ, having been baptized into Christ, this allows us to have what the Bible calls a living hope. A living expectation of what faithful children of God have a right to expect and earnestly desire, and that is heaven itself. Notice to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4. Have you ever had reserved seats to anywhere? Certainly most of us have. They're waiting on you when you get there. You have the ticket. Well, this may be overly simplistic, but when you obey the gospel and live righteous before Him and His church, heaven's your home. You have a place reserved in heaven for you. On the other hand, when you read Revelation 21, 8, and all those who die outside of Christ are unfaithful to Him, there is a place reserved for you too. Notice all liars shall have their part, in this other's there, have their part. They have reserved seat also in the lake which burned with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So there's reserved seats for those who love the Lord, for those who consider their Christian calling, the gospel, they're living by it, and those who do not. Paul told the brethren in Corinth then to consider their calling. Can I do even better than that to consider your calling? So we too must consider our calling. We've been called through the gospel to live up to God's standard that is found within the truth of the New Testament, the perfect law of liberty. Many reject this call because they value the things of the world over the things of God. All I can say to that is, let us not be like them. Let's cultivate a love for God, a love for His truth, and a love for submitting to it. We are more wise, more mighty, and more noble in the true sense of those words through Jesus Christ and having been called by the gospel to Him. If we reject the calling, if we reject Christ, there is an eternal shame yet ahead of us. And it will not stop. It will not end. So the Lord offers us salvation. And thus we should be wise. We should understand we can't save ourselves. We should recognize that we cannot find any kind of way so that my sins can be cleansed among men. That way is presented in the gospel and the church ought to be mindful as we are under the commission to teach that gospel that we are teaching that which calls men out of service to sin and to self and offers them the way of eternal life. We studied already this morning what one outside of Christ needs to believe and do to become a Christian. For those who are Christians, we urge you to consider yourself. Have you considered your calling? Are you evaluating yourself daily and examining yourself to see whether you be in the faith? If you haven't done as you ought or left undone what you should have done, repent of those things and pray God for forgiveness having confessed them. And we can leave right here on this note that God accept our worship. And if we've obeyed the gospel, we leave here saved, reconciled to Him, ready for anything this world has to offer. And we have the wherewithal to deal with it. So if you're subject to the gospel call, 
We invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.